Hey guys, welcome back. I decided to film this video actually based on a couple conversations that I had with a few people yesterday and they were demonstrating their frustration to me about the fact that they were trying to explain to people why this was a little bit more concerning of a situation than not. And so I thought, you know what, some people are visual learners. Let me go ahead and put together, um, I'm actually a user experience designer by trade, so I deal a lot with digital imaging and whatnot. So I thought, let me just go ahead and, and put something together that maybe it's easier for people to kind of read. And then I decided to turn that into a video and that's what you're gonna see when I'm done talking here. Um, just in the hopes that it makes it easier for some people to maybe understand the implications and what they can do. So that is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna switch now to my computer. I hope you guys enjoy this. All right, so let's just go quickly through this little presentation that I put together because I know a lot of people are visual learners, so I thought let's maybe attack this from a different angle. Um, and I'm not saying that any of this will happen. This is just kind of a look at some basic numbers and what may be unfolding here in the next couple of weeks. So how could the coronavirus impact your life and what's in store for us? All right, interaction is central to how we live. And you know, I don't have to put a slide up here for us to all know that. We all go grocery shopping and socializing and shopping and all kinds of other things that is just part of the world that we live in. And a huge question right now and an increasing question for people is their safety. You know, how can you stay safe from a virus that you cannot see, that we do not have a vaccine for, and for which we have no immunity? And so I'm sure you've heard the term herd immunity like we have for the flu, and that means that a large percentage of your population has been vaccinated. That is not the case here with the coronavirus. All right, NPIs, and I touched on this the other day in one of my videos, and those are non-pharmaceutical interventions. You can't have pharmaceutical interventions if you do not have a viable treatment, nor do you have a vaccine. So NPIs are tools that people can use to limit the spread of disease during an outbreak until a vaccine becomes available. And there are three types of NPIs, and I'm sure that you've heard a lot of this on the news, but I just wanted to show you kind of how we break this down. So there are personal, community, and environmental NPIs. All right, personal tools. Stay home if you are ill. Cough or sneeze into your elbow or a tissue, and then immediately dispose of the tissue and wash your hands. Wash your hands with soap and water or use hand sanitizer. Wear masks, gloves, and eye protection, and do not touch your face, eyes, or mouth with dirty hands. So those are the things that you can have in your own personal arsenal to keep yourself safe. Community tools, things that we might see happen, and we're seeing them happen all around the world, school closures, telecommuting, canceling of large events, business closures, social distancing, and of course, ultimately quarantines. And environmental tools are keeping surfaces clean, not wearing shoes in the house, and of course being careful what you touch because you don't want to pick up a pathogen, the virus, and then put it, you know, accidentally rub your eye and there you have a problem. So why do we use these tools? Obviously to slow or stop the spread of a virus. Um, the r naught again I touched on this in some of my previous videos, is a number that tells us how many people will potentially be infected by a single person. For example, if the r naught were three, then one person could spread it to three people who would each then potentially spread it on to three more people and so on and so on. And you'll see here in this little graph, I'm trying to demonstrate that. So Bob infects Sally, Joe, and Frank, and then those three people infect three other people, and then each of these people infect three other people, and then each of those, you get the idea. And so that's why I put the picture of these crowds here is that it just takes, you know, and uh, Director Tedros from the World Health Organization has said, you know, it only takes a spark to start a fire. And that is definitely the truth here. What impact could it have? And for myself, I wanted to run some general numbers, so I thought I'd include it here. The world has roughly 7.7 .7 billion people, and that's kind of a number that's so large that it's hard to wrap your mind around. So because I live in the United States, I decided to use the US for this particular example. Let's use some basic numbers from the United States as an example. The United States has a total population of 331 million people. Now, most of the press coverage is saying that 80% of people who are infected only experience mild symptoms, 20% of those people, um, or excuse me, 20% have serious or critical complications, and of course, depending on who you're listening to, between 2 and 5% unfortunately will not survive this coronavirus. 
So with those numbers in mind, let's say that using the number 331 million, if only 30% of those people became infected with the coronavirus, and obviously I'm being very generous, if you're dealing with something like an epidemic or a pandemic, you're usually looking at numbers between 60 and 70 and potentially even higher than that with respect to total percentage of the population that would be infected. So if 30% of people became infected with the coronavirus, that would be approximately 100 million people. If 80% of those 100 million people had mild symptoms, that would give you 80 million people who had relatively mild symptoms, but who are unfortunately still contagious and very likely either asymptomatic or symptomatic. But my point is that those 80% who are experiencing mild symptoms likely will not report to their doctor because they potentially do not even know that they have a problem, okay? but they're still contagious. So that R naught still applies to them. If they're infected, they could potentially infect other people. And if the other 20% had serious or critical medical needs, that would be 20 million people. And assuming that only 2% of those people died from the coronavirus, that would be a loss of life of roughly 400,000 Americans who would die. Now, I don't know the last time you went to an emergency room or even your general practitioner, but can you imagine that our medical system in this country, in the United States, having to deal with a rather sudden influx of 20 million people suddenly needing serious medical treatment at once? I'm not talking about mild symptoms because those people do not require things like ECMO and mechanical ventilation and dialysis and being intubated. Those people are just going to be told, go home, self-isolate, take care of yourself. But if 20 million people cause a surge of an influx on our medical system, I think it's fair to say that we could be looking at a very challenging situation. And of course, please be mindful that this is one country, just the United States. As of the recording of this video, and today is Saturday, 29 February, there are 60 countries that I'm aware as of the time that I'm filming this that have cases. So. This could become a global problem, it is a global problem, with pretty serious consequences. So let's move forward. How can you prepare? And again, not being said to instill panic, but, and I'm gonna to touch on this in a later video, you know, yes, the government has a responsibility to you and to protect you and your family, but you also have a responsibility to protect yourself and your family just based on what is happening in the world and needing to pay attention. So. How can you prepare? You can stock your home with between two weeks and three months worth of food and water. And this way you just don't have to be around potentially infected people if you're asked to stay at home. And even if you're not asked to stay at home and you are allowed to move about freely, you don't wanna be going to the grocery store where you're having to pick up things that droves of other people have been touching and been around. So just save yourself the trouble and add some extra food to your pantry. And definitely don't forget about your pets and any special dietary situations which may need to be considered, such as diabetes or anything like that. All right, second thing you can do, and the reason I'm going over this is I think a lot of us kind of feel like they keep saying prepare, but what does that mean? So here are some basic things that you can do to prepare, okay? Make sure that you have enough prescription and over-the-counter medication for yourself, your family members, and your pets for several months because even if there is no problem with someone becoming ill, supply chain distributions are being experienced around the world. So even if you don't need it right now, if you need it in two months and it's not there, that could potentially become a problem for you. So just make sure that it's not a problem for yourself and just add a little bit extra. The good thing about all of this stuff is that you will use it over the course of your normal daily life anyway. You're just spending a little bit upfront. Okay, consider purchasing items which may protect you should you have a need to leave your home. Things like masks, gloves, eyewear protection, Tyvek suits, etc. And this is all referred to as PPE or personal protective equipment. All right. And probably one of the best things that you can do is to just make a plan. And I'll be talking about this in a later video this week. You know, have a plan. Ha have three plans, right? What are you going to do if you have to stay at home? What are you going to do if you need to leave? What are you going to do if, say, that you know you're a, a husband and wife and and you have a child and that child becomes ill, what's the plan? How are you going to manage that situation? Because the time to plan for a crisis is not when you are in the middle of it 
and your emotions are involved. It's, it's to do it now while your head is clear, just have a plan. All right, and something that I haven't heard a lot of people saying, but I think this is super important, it is for me, um, keep your vehicle gassed up, and if you have any kind of critical repairs or just general maintenance that you need to run on your vehicle, oil change, swap out a tire, this would be a really good opportunity to take care of that because in the event that you did have to leave, you don't want to find yourself with a vehicle that you cannot drive. All right. And, you know, I think we suffer from this a lot, a lot of cognitive dissonance, dissonance excuse me, happening here in the United States. Um, is this really possible? Could this really happen here? Yes, of course it could because it is happening all around the world. And unfortunately, viruses do not respect borders and they don't care what nation you are in. It just, they just don't care. So um, just again, some more facts, you know, the world was first made aware of the coronavirus on or about, depending on who you believe, 3 December 2019. Today, 89 days later, there are 85,708 worldwide infections, yes, predominantly in China, but still again, 60 plus countries involved as of today, and 2,933 dead. That is a number that should warrant some kind of attention. Um, what started in Wuhan, China has now reached more than 60 countries worldwide with epidemics developing in South Korea, Italy, Iran, and more. We live in a very interconnected world, which is the reason why you see this picture of these planes here. You know, how many planes are moving around the world every day? And that's not just planes. You know, we have trains, we have cruise ships, people drive. And, you know, the World Health Organization raised the global threat level to very high, issuing its strongest warning to all countries to prepare for the arrival of this virus. And I would like to see a lot more of that being done where I live here, but that's the World Health Organization attempting, some would say, a day late and a dollar short to tell countries to prepare. All right, so I wanted to look a little bit forward so it's not all doom and gloom. Um, let's assume that we have to engage in NPIs of social distancing. And what could that mean for you? That could mean that they ask you to stay inside your house for a period of time. And what could that new reality look like? So I just wanted to go through that. So here are some predictions. All right, school and work. People will need to work and attend school from home to participate in social distancing efforts to reduce the impact of the coronavirus within their communities. This is just good measure. Industry and sports. Events will need to be live streamed or canceled to reduce the number of large crowds coming together during an outbreak. Retail and business. Businesses may have to close temporarily or reduce hours and staff to limit the amount of interaction between people to mitigate the risk of spreading this highly contagious virus. Shopping and, excuse me, shopping and entertainment. Expect a dramatic increase in online shopping, food delivery, gaming, and streaming video entertainment. Netflix is, you know, going to be Netflix, Disney, those, those things are all going to experience a surge probably because if people are stuck at home, they need to be entertained. Yes. Healthcare. The need for mental health professionals and remote medical workers will rise as people attempt to treat the ill at home, manage family contacts, and keep themselves mentally and emotionally strong. And some people may think, what do you mean manage family conflicts? Because I don't care how much you love your family, if you're trapped in the same house for two weeks or let's say a month, there are going to be some issues, some friction that may arise just simply because of the stress of the situation and because you're all in such close quarters. And that's a best case scenario, assuming that one or more people do not become ill. So that is going to be something that people are going to need to, to manage. Friends, family, and community, there will be a dramatic increase in the use of social media and online social gatherings in groups and communities to help people feel connected to one another. Because I think a lot of people, especially single people, will feel very alone. And I think you'll see a lot of communities kind of forming around this just so that it's a good morale booster. Mail and packages. Mail will become electronic mail, assuming that it went on for a sustained period of time. And packages may be delivered at drop spots or via robots as contactless deliveries increase. Um, I think we'd have to have a sustained situation to see those two things happen, but we're just taking a look forward at what could happen. Dating and romance, I put this in there just because, you know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. 
Uh, dating app sites and businesses that foster online dates will have a large surge as people attempt to maintain their normal dating patterns and find ways to connect together online. So this is just to say that even if you become quarantined, um, this does not mean that it is the end of the world. It means that it is a shift in the way that you interact with the world normally. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just pointing out that these are some things that may come to pass and it's good to just mentally sort of digest that and go, okay, yeah, I could handle that. Um, and, and I thought an important quote in closing, what you deny or ignore, you delay, and what you accept and face, you conquer. And I wanted to include that because I think if you empower yourself with information and you understand what could potentially happen, you face that reality, you, you sit down across the table from it and you go, okay, I can survive that. I can manage that. It becomes less terrifying. And then there is nothing to panic over because you simply say, okay, I've walked through the logistics of what that new reality may look like for a short or, you know, three to six month long situation and, and it's not terrible and I can manage that. So that was the purpose of this video. I really hope you found that helpful. I know a lot of people are visual learners, which is why I wanted to put this on here. If you found this presentation, um, well, video helpful and you'd like to share it, feel free to share it. If you have any questions, please leave them below. Um, don't forget to like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe and turn on the little bell notification if you want to be notified when I upload new videos. I hope that everybody just takes a deep breath and understands that regardless of whatever information you are or are not hearing on the local and national media, that again, I wanna take this as an opportunity to call you to accountability for yourself that you have a responsibility to yourself and to your family to protect against the unknown. So even if it doesn't come to pass, none of those things that we just discussed will be harmful to your family. So it is a complete win for your family if you do prepare and potentially a very fatal loss if you do not prepare. So just you know, make it so that you and your family can sleep easier at night and just do a little preparation. All right, you guys, I will see you in the next video. Thanks for spending some time with me. Take care. Bye-bye.